a leg extension or a leg curl, you go up with both legs and you lower with one leg. So you could do like first one up and you lower with your right leg, second one up, you lower with your left leg. And uh, you can eccentric overload in that fashion. And if I know what shape a pelvis should be and a rib cage should be, then I'm more likely to get the correct information to be able to travel to the brain so that I can have the sensory information traveling. So it's like picking the right figureheads almost to create these indexes for exercise that increase in complexity towards the ultimate challenge of that system. The most successful people in the world, like they learn from mistakes, they, they had a specific, they had to start at the finish line mentality. And if they're not doing the same thing with their health and wellness, well, just take the same approach, put it here. I'm doing really well at one of them. Don't pursue that one more, even though that is our tendency. Pursue the one that maybe you're not so good at. You know, you're only as good as the weakest link is a really important systems analysis approach. So your body is a complex system, so always approach the weakest links. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Ben Pakulski. As always, we, I at Muscle Intelligence, aspire to bring you the best information in the world to help you live your greatest life in a body you love. I often suggest like three out of 10 as far as the soreness, like it never go over five out of 10. Like if you're over a five out of 10, it's too much. Completely. And for my clients, I'm like, your, your goal is three out of 10. And so you know, sometimes that's super subjective. I just want you to try to land around three to 10. And that that's a hard thing to do. And, and again, there's definitely times where I've been a nine out of 10 and you feel accomplished, but usually it takes a week to recover and ultimately you end up leaving with more pain than progress. So I uh, totally agree on that. And yeah. 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 Amazing, man. Great insights. By the way, the, the issue with soreness too, is that it's very variable between people. Two people can do the exact same workout and one is massively sore and the other. So soreness, while it has certain relevance to muscle damage it is not an exact right uh, and perception of, right right like you yeah know, it, what we may be sore to you like i may be like oh my god this is excruciating whereas to you like i'm good and, and there is seems to be differences between males and females where females yeah. don't get as sore perhaps mediated through estrogen and so again that's while soreness is a general indicator it's a very crude indicator and uh, i certainly though just from a perception standpoint like you said if you're really sore it's going to be difficult for you to to train yeah. I'm very curious to hear what your thoughts and beliefs are around um, mechanistically what's actually causing the soreness. Because you hear different theories that, you know, it's it's chemical, meaning, it, you know, it's some type of biochemical shift, uh, acid or whatever in, in the muscle that's causing this discomfort that ultimately it's some type of mechanical shortening of the muscles temporarily um, that can maybe be alleviated. So, so what I'm getting to is I ultimately want to know, let's say we do leave the gym and two days later we're a 7 to 10. What are kind of best course of actions to alleviate that, right? Is it, listen, I mean, we know like the basic things in blood flow and movement, but I'm curious mechanistically um, if there's something specific like, hey, this is happening, therefore we should do that. Yeah. So the best um, evidence at this point, from my perspective, is that it probably is mostly due to uh, alterations in the extracellular matrix, which sits above the sarcolemma, the uh, muscle membrane. The extracellular matrix, by the way, has uh, a lot of important functions in hypertrophy. But anyway, it's it's a a layer that sits above the the sarcolemma, the muscle membrane, and there's structural alterations to it that allow chemicals, ke ke various noxious chemicals, if you will, to interact, the free radicals and other molecules, and that nociceptors, which are pain receptors within the the body, sense that. But again, as, as you said, people's, first of all, that, so that would indicate that it's not necessarily related to damage of the muscle, the contractile elements themselves, but it could be more extracellular matrix damage, which might have other factors. Usually they occur in tandem, but not necessarily. Um, as far as what can be done, you kind of hit on the, the primary factor that would be beneficial is activity being moderately doing, uh, you know, n not sitting around basically. So being yeah. moderately active for the tissues that have been affected. Uh, if you sit around, so you, you're just not getting your blood flow going properly. And as you mentioned, uh, or hinted at nutrient delivery is very important for, for the repair of, of tissue. Some people, the massage can't hurt. Some people do feel it might be placebo because it's, it's hard to sham in research massage, but some people do ex uh, report experiencing lesser 
late onset muscle soreness, post massage, foam rolling, some people feel. But again, these might be more placebo effects. But even if, you know what, if they're placebo and they help you, uh, even if they're not actually doing it, it's a good thing. So, uh, but be active is the most important thing. Yeah, I often tell the story uh, that really shifted my belief around what's uh, what post workout soreness is. Where I walked in, I was probably a nine out of ten in soreness. I trained legs, I was getting into Olympia or something. I just like crushed it, and you know, just like literally, really jacked up, really, really sore. And I walked into a therapy session with a guy who does muscle activation techniques, Greg Roscoff, who's a great friend of mine in Denver. And uh, I walked in, literally limping, couldn't move. I was like, so I couldn't walk upstairs. And I left that with zero soreness and it never came back. It wasn't like temporary. And I was like, okay. And he doesn't do massage, right? He does muscle activation. So it's not like he was even physically touching that area. He was touching other areas of my body. And his and he was like, hey, we're going to make the mobility better at these joints that are rigid. And so basically my thought was, you know, what I deduce actually happened was maybe he took the sympathetic nervous system offline, brought it down a little bit, but you know, realign the structure, structural balance. And the body just like opened up and I had zero soreness when I left the office, which is 90 minutes later. And I was like, this, this completely blew my mind, turned my, my understanding of what I thought damage was on head. I was like, I don't understand what this is. And that's why I asked that question. Cause it's so obvious that it's not an actual mechanical thing. Cause otherwise it would continue. It's, it's, it's not like a cut where it's like, you know, you can put your hand in a cut and as soon as you take the hand away, it's, it's, it's the hurts again. With this one, like I put, you know, somebody put a, a hand on the cut and then took it away. and It was gone. So it's really interesting that that just kind of confused my understanding in the moment, made me challenge what I thought I knew. Yeah. And most people think that we're, we have all the answers through research and research really in these types of things, the basic sports science research is only several decades old. I mean, you go back to the, uh, certainly resistance training, we're talking like the 1980s Mm is when the genesis of it uh, started for the most part. And really it's only been over the past maybe 20 years that we've had a lot of, a lot more research. It's been much more extensively researched. We had a few labs back in the previous century and uh, now it's, it's exploded. So I would hope that over time you're going to see a, uh, uh, it'll be an exponential increase in our understanding over the next five, 10 years. And that will start to get more concrete answers to these questions. But I know, you know, people come to a researcher and say, you know, tell me what the research shows. And you got to let them know that uh, the research still is, we're still speculating on a lot of these things because the research is, for in many respects, inconclusive. Yeah, all the, re- all the good researchers I know have, say, I have no idea. Here's what I think. <laughs> That's what seems to be the response. So question for you, Brad. I'm curious about the, the kind of the four phases of a rep and how those are mechanistically different, how those are influencing, you know, maybe the metabolic stress, the tension, the damage, and ultimately the outcomes uh, of it. So when I say, you know, maybe three phases. So concentric, eccentric, isometric, uh, kind of the shit, the, the, the direct directional change. So I'm curious if, if you have any insights on, you know, walking us through each of those mechanistically, how they may be different. Sure. So I'll start with the transition phases, the quote unquote isometric transition phases. Really not much evidence. We don't just, that's not been a studied topic. So it's very difficult to know. There's been one study in particular that kind of intrigues me. And I, I think it's an area that I'd like to see more research in perhaps our lab will do it, that showed that maintaining, not locking out, basically keeping tension within the muscle rather than having a lockout where you're held might be better. But how that, it's not comparing it to, let's say, a ISO hold at the top. Basically, it was just stopping at the top. So mm-hmm. anyway, these are things that need to be uh, figured out more. But concentric versus eccentric, we have a much better idea. And that's something that's been quite well studied. Both components of the repetition, concentric and eccentric, certainly are important for hypertrophy. And they, they are additive by all accounts that we have, that doing one or the other is you'll have submaximal hypertrophy or suboptimal hypertrophy. So if you want to maximize hypertrophy, doing a complete rep, concentric and eccentric is important. Very interestingly, though, there at least seem to be different mechanisms by, with, by which hypertrophy is obtained, which would indicate that there is a synergistic aspect that you'll get additive benefits as far as that goes. There also was some good evidence that you get different hypertrophy in different regions. So we, it's very well documented that hypertrophy happens in a non-uniform manner, so regional specific. It's most seen in the quadriceps. We have a lot of evidence where the distal aspect, the uh, area closest to the knee, I, I just want to, I know some people in the audience might not know these scientific yeah. terms, so I want to make sure 
So the, the distal is the area closest to the knee, the proximal is the area closest to the hip, and the mid portion, of course, is in the middle. And that you'll see differential hypertrophic responses based on different types of training programs. Well, it's been shown that eccentric exercise tends to have greater hypertrophy distally in the quadriceps, and that concentric uh, actions have greater mid hypertrophy, uh, elicit greater hypertrophy in the mid region. So again, you're getting different mechanistic aspects, potentially. Again, more research needs to be carried out there, and also differential regional specific responses. So they're additive. And then that goes to what are mechanistically the underlying uh, rationales. Well, we do know there's greater tension on fewer fibers on eccentric action. So when you're lowering an action, a weight that there is a, at least theoretically, some of the fibers will drop out and you're having more of the fast twitch fibers are taking over for the entire force producing capacity with a fewer number of total fibers. So more stress on fewer fibers. Could that be driving results? We don't know. Could it be the damaging aspects? So we talked before about the potential for muscle damage. Eccentric exercise is associated with greater muscle damage, damaging effects of, of uh, resistance training. So again, mechanistically, we can speculate, but there's no clear path to it. Certainly what I would say is, is that a number one, very strong rationale for doing both eccentric and concentric actions. And I do think that of all the, um, all the advanced training methods that probably eccentric overload, eccentric, accentuated eccentric contractions probably have the, at least to this point, the most uh, sound rationale for uh, using that you use a weight higher than your concentric 1RM or certainly higher than your training load. A great way to do that in an ecologically valid way is let's say in a leg extension or a leg curl, you go up with both legs and you lower with the with one leg. So you could do like first one up and you lower with your right leg, second one up, you lower with your left leg and uh, you can eccentric overload in that fashion. Physical therapy is divided into the structural ap approach and the functional approach. And that the structural approach people are going to be the ones that, that like, it's kind of still Sarman versus Yanda. You know, Shirley Sarman, Vladimir Yanda. And Sarman had this very, very anatomical presentation trying to find the point of instantaneous center of rotation of a joint. And when the point of instantaneous center of rotation is shifted from where the physiological optimum is, it's due to likely having a tight, short muscle on one side of the joint, while the other side of the joint has a longer, low tone, weak muscle. That's, you know, quite honestly, I, I just bastardized and summarized so much profound work into a small snippet statement that people feel comfortable with. And it makes me uncomfortable to do that. But it's to get across the point that that's like one side of the equation. And that is kind of like, okay, strengthen the long, weak side and lengthen the short, tight side. And again, that's an oversimplification, but people know that. And so I'm just going to let that kind of stand as, as the structural approach side. And the functional approach side with which Yonda started is based on looking at the skeletal muscle tissue as a story of what's happening at the level of the brain. And Yonda said that the skeletal muscle is at the crosshairs of the nervous system. And I love that term crosshairs for this because it's exactly the midpoint between the afferent and the efferent sides of the nervous system. So it's, it's a perfect term to describe what the, the, where the skeletal muscle is in relation to the nervous system. And Yanda would say, he used the term lesion a lot. Like lesion gets kind of a bad, as soon as I say lesion, people are like, oh my God, a lesion. What the hell is that? Like, do I have AIDS at my am president presenting at the skin with this? Or, you know, but he would term it a brain lesion for every muscle that would be in a state of either excess tone or inadequate tone, long and weak or short and tight. And Yanda originally coined these kind of terms like cross syndrome stuff, upper cross syndrome, lower cross syndrome, you know, lower cross syndrome being when the pelvis is anteriorly tipped and we have short, tight hip flexors 
and we have long glutes and hamstrings and um, upper cross syndrome where the person is kind of like internally oriented with their arms and their head is driven forward through space. So they have, uh, you know, long, weak, deep neck flexors, short, tight suboccipitals. They have short, tight pecs and long, weak rhomboids. And, you know, what, and then there's layered syndrome, which is that you have both upper crossed and lower crossed at the same time. And that'll feature kind of like long, weak abdominals as well. That's in the lower crossed and short, tight posterior intercostals and spinal erectors. So Yanda was of the belief that this is not so much a function of, you know, the muscles are telling the story of what's happening at the brain would be how, how he would kind of think about it. And a lot of his work was done with people that existed in spasticity. It's like spasticity based patients, people with cerebral palsy and other spasticity conditions. And you can see these stereotypical patterns of upper and lower cross presentations driven to the maximum in spasticity patients. Um, and so he would say that it's, it's indicative of greater amounts of motor neuron uh, lesion or sensory neuron lesion. And the way that he would approach this stuff is that you have to send more information back to the brain, okay, as a physical therapist. Now, this could change, like if you go into like the, some of the books that Norman Doidge has written recently, The Brain That Changes Itself and The Brain's Way of Healing, it kind of picks up on a lot of this functional approach stuff. And it really speaks to the idea that like you can change, like he, he's gone in in his books and talked about Parkinson's patients and autism and, you know, just everything under the sun that could be related to like motor based problems and, and different interventions that go directly to the brain that can impact mostly the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus being sort of this like central point where if I activate every part of the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus has wires that go to every other part of the brain. So if I activate the hypothalamus, I activate the entire brain and I light it up like a stadium lights at a ballpark where, where it's prime time game at night. In, in those books, it talks about using other inputs to different sensory systems. Like it, it, chronicled um alfred tomatis the french doctor who invented something called the electric ear which he originally used to give opera singers the ability to sing notes they lost as their careers aged he discovered that as soon as these singers lost the ability to hear the note they could no longer produce the note uh, acoustically so he built the electric ear which gave them the ability to have the frequencies that they no longer could naturally hear sent to their brain and as soon as their brain was able to hear it again, they could sing it again. Right. And what's interesting is Tomatis's electric ear then began to be used with autism-based cases. Uh, a lot of people think autism is actually a hearing disorder because the temper tympani muscle in the inner ear is usually, you know, long, like long and weak in people with autism. And they don't have the ability to zoom in auditorily. You know, you can zoom in with your eyes. But if you're in a crowded restaurant or something like that, and you hear something interesting at the table next to you, you can zoom in with your ears and selectively listen to something more specifically. And you do that by altering the tone of your temper tympani muscle, where autistic children oftentimes have a weakness of that muscle, and they have a hard time differentiating between sounds. So all sounds are kind of coming in in an overwhelming manner. And autistic children usually present with very stereotypically the same sort of a skeletal muscle situation where they're oftentimes toe walkers and their weight is too far forward. And they will present with kind of a, um, you know, a crossed syndrome presentation. So when Yanda was writing, he would say that, you know, the only approach that we have is to drive information in from the skeletal muscle. And that that's essentially what physical therapists usually do is they're trying to work at specific parts of the skeletal muscle system where there's higher sensory input that can go back to the brain. He 
pointed out that the soles of the feet were a information hub. His other information hubs were were some other ones that you kind of can typically think of. Uh, but you know, I don't know if it's Yonda's work, but sacro craniosacral therapies are based on this stuff, where the sacrum is a information hub, the cranium is an information hub, hands, the visual system is an information hub. Essentially, what it's talking about though is that the brain craves information, sensory information being sent back to it. Any of these things are possible centers. The, the there's another piece of technology called the Pons device that was invented at the University of Wisconsin, and it attaches to your tongue. And the Pons device is able to utilize the tongue as a direct pathway to the hypothalamus and then light the hypothalamus up. And then they give you, they try to feed you specific sensory stimuli that would be in the area that you're lacking the most. For instance, like they've allowed blind people to be able to see with the Pons device by hooking them up to external agents. Like, I don't know exactly how that works, but essentially like the person will be hooked up to some kind of a visual piece of technology while using the Pons device. And by activating the hypothalamus and lighting up the neural networks that have become dormant, the visual, like you don't see with your eyes, you see with your brain. Right. The visual systems information center is able to be activated for vision based information, which is essentially just light coming into your brain. And they've really worked with a lot of Parkinson's patients and they've seen like dramatic, almost immediate kinds of responses where you can take a Parkinson's patient that's extreme and basically have them dancing and doing other things that are pretty sophisticated as long as they have the pawns device in. And then they gradually try to reduce the amount of pawns exposure over time to the point where the person's neural network has been revived and is now functioning on its own without the assistance of that device. But, you know, this is all stuff that I would say began with Yonda's theories on the, you know, the functional approach to recovery, which is a neurological approach to recovery. Now, for me, within the model that I use, I basically look at the, I, I utilize both approaches. I just simply start with the structural approach. And then I transition to the functional approach because I believe that certain shapes are more suitable for re certain responses, like balls roll and blocks slide and top spin. And if I know what shape a pelvis should be and a rib cage should be, then I'm more likely to get the correct information to be able to travel to the brain so that I can have the sensory information traveling. Because ultimately, the thing that people that subscribe to the functional approach can't talk about is that the brain is a black box. You send information to it, and then you have no idea what's happening. You know what I mean? I still have no idea what's happening. I just have a hypothesis that the more organized towards optimal the shape of different structures can be the more likely it is that the sensory information that's going up will be organized in a more meaningful manner to lead to a more predictable stereotypical output of the efferent side there's downstream effects and then there's there's like acute short-term stimuli, right? So the way I articulate it is I take a systems approach to bodybuilding, right? And it sounds like it's a similar thing that you're talking about. It's like we're looking at all the different systems that we need to progress and ultimately stress and, and tax to adapt. Similar concept. Like, so like walking through when, when I say systems approach, you could be like, okay, I got to progress the nervous system, muscular system, the cardiovascular system, the uh, skeletal system, like all these things need to progress the soft tissues. I think it's the understanding your inherent baseline across all of those systems, which is going to give you an upper hand in programming where a lot of people adopt exercise prescription based off of a baseline signature that's not theirs, mm -hmm. right? So they adopt a baseline signature of someone who maybe has a better aerobic system than them, or it maybe has a higher base in strength than them. Like I look at it ultimately like plate spinning, right? Just totally. like the, yeah. the parlor trick of keeping all these plates spinning and understanding that like for me, from a strength perspective, at least with compound movements, those plates are spinning quite fast. So it's like, where are my, you know, where can I deprioritize 
those movements in lieu of other movements that tax other systems that will give me a greater yield on that investment of time in totally. the session. And your lowest amount of stimulus for the maximum effect. Right. So like just looking at it from almost like a, a training economy standpoint, like mm. what are the economical yields that allow me for the greatest return on my investment of time? And that way I'm not left chasing novelty in the gym and I can be really specific and understand, you know, exercise order, exercise execution, all the way down to the level of, you know, system or energy system. And then I can just drive that stimulus and stoke that fire and make sure that there's no wasted, there's no wasted reps, there's no wasted time. So someone listening, how they start to, to decode what you're saying there. So is it like, what, what is the lowest order of, you know, operations to address? So for me, it's, I'm coming in with a strong base from a strength, strength. perspective. So CNS load, which I think in itself is worth diving into a little bit and understanding that a lot of times what we often attribute to CNS fatigue is an accumulation of PNS fatigue. So understanding the difference between central nervous system and peripheral nervous system fatigue, like a, a bodybuilder will drive a lot of peripheral nervous system fatigue. What's the difference between central and peripheral nervous system? I'm glad I asked. Central nervous system is your brain, your spinal cord, right? Where your peripheral nervous system is all of the ancillary spinal nerves that go out and innervate your muscles that create contractions or more importantly, I think from a fatigue standpoint, co-contractions, right? So what degree does my brain have to be active in a bicep curl? What this is the C5 ventral spinal nerve goes out to the bicep, causes some sort of depolarization, sarcoplasmic reticulum, some calcium release. We elicit, you know, a muscle contraction. That's not taxing on my central nervous system. My brain and my spinal, huh? what you get like it's not that hard so central nervous system fatigue if i'm trying to groove a 750 squat there's a lot of feedback right there's a lot coming in there's a lot going out there's a lot working into the brain there's you know i would say that basketball is a far more or golf maybe a far more taxing central nervous system pursuit than something like bodybuilding because you're dealing a lot at the level of the central nervous system understanding the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord Whereas like bodybuilding is very much peripheral. So I would say I have a stronger base just coming from such a strong training bias towards one system that I, you know, my central nervous system threshold is very high. That plate is spinning very fast. So I need to start looking at, you know, maybe driving volume as a priority over intensity because intensity and coordination and co-contraction for multi-joint compound movements, I do very well, very efficiently. And that's large in part to the adaptations made at the central nervous system. So for me, it's really, and that, that's unique. Most people don't come in with one plate already spinning very fast. So a lot of it could be looking for you who are listening that aren't necessarily coming in with a strong training bias, a strong system that's already running that will immediately deprioritize that system and allow you to start to look elsewhere, you know, using volume, using density from an aerobic capacity standpoint to start to challenge other systems you might be lacking. Knowing how to align exercises that fit has very good indicators of performance across all of these systems is a good way to start. So, you know, strength of a quad extension is not necessarily going to be something that uh, gives us a accurate insight, a clear view into our body's ability to actually create systemic strength because it's, it's, it's isolated. It's devoid of any co-contraction or can be it can be executed with minimal co-contraction where a squat cannot exist without minimal co-contraction or maximum co-contraction to make sure that the form is maintained so it's like picking the right figureheads almost to create these indexes for exercise that increase in complexity towards the ultimate challenge of that system right and think of it like flipping through a phone book Pakulski, good example. P, or maybe a radio station might be better. Seek and scan. The fuck, who listens to radio anymore? Remember when you used to like go on long car rides? Yeah, of course. The seek versus the scan. Right. So, right. So one is flipping from frequency to frequency that is received by the transmitter. One is just going 89.9, 80 or 90, 90.1, 90 90.2, just scanning through the, the frequencies to see what, uh, what is out there. So I see a lot of times when people organize exercises, they don't understand the index, like the phone book, for example, the phone book, 
So the phone book for those of you kids listening was this thing that we used to go to. They, they would drop it <laughs> off depending on the size of your town. It could be very small, or very big. It was a, it was all the people that lived in your town's phone numbers based off of the last name. But the phone book had white pages and the yellow pages. So white pages were for the business and or sorry, yellow pages were for business and white pages were for personal or residential. Are you old enough to remember that? Yeah, of course. Come on. Only seven years. You're in 83? 81. 81. I'm only nine years younger than you. Nine years younger. <laughs> Again, the aging thing. <laughs> You're aging in reverse. So l- let's stick with this example of white pages and yellow pages. So these are two indexes in this book. Both follow, you know, alphabetical order. One is for business, one is for personal. So what the goal is, let's identify the adaptations we want to make, that we need to make, our lowest hanging fruit, our highest yield, our most economical choices for exercise selection based off of an overarching adaptation in the same way that the overarching indexes in these in the phone books is personal and, and business. Then let's order them, not by chronological order, because that would be silly, but let's order them by complexity. Right. Or the barrier of entrance from most com- or least complex to most complex. So the uh, one that comes to mind is always the big three. Right. The big three McGill's big three this is your podcast. So I'm not going to go off the deep end of why I don't like this. But maybe we can infer the, the inefficiencies that arrive out of the system by using this analogy of the phone book. The big three, the bird dog, the curl up and the side plank are essentially isolated attempts at testing the capacity of anti-lateral flexion, anti-rotation, and anti-flexion extension of the spine, right? So bird dog would be more anti-rotation with this offset quadruped stance. The side plank would be a more anti-lateral flexion. Not that either is exclusive, right? Side plank can have an anti-rotation component to it as well. And then the curl up probably in the most pure to its taxonomy is anti-flexion extension. Let's put those three at the top and go, okay, these are the simplest, most refined, lowest barrier of entry to spinal stabilization through three planes of movement, if we ascribe to the triplanar model. How is it that we could make incremental jumps in the stimulus of anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion, anti-flexion extension, right? So one might look at the bird dog, for example, and think, and this is where my brain goes, the bird dog is actually step two. I would say step one in anti-rotation is probably a dead bug. Why? Because we have greater reference point with our entire spine stabilized on the ground before we suspend our spine in space in this offset quadruped position. So now we have a a new top of the index and we go, okay, we have dead bug. Now we have bird dog. Well, where do we go from there? Well, the bird dog can be dynamic, right? We can do offset and reps. We can do offset um, shoulder flexion and hip extension. We could add weight or we could go to something like a single leg RDL. We go to single leg leg RDL supported. Well, that's going to be, you know, one degree closer to a supported bird dog position. So we can use external support to broaden our base of support to make it more stable. And a single leg RDL with a contralateral support being a incremental step forward towards ultimately the single RDL unloaded and then ipsilaterally contralaterally loaded, right? So using these different indexes and just knowing how to scale it. Now, next price progression becomes really easy because it's all performance. Just creating like a hierarchy of how to progress from X to Y. That's it. But the biggest thing that's difficult for most people is understanding the similarities in overarching adaptation that each index can provide, Mm. right? Like we can look at exercises that benefit bicep hypertrophy. It's like we have a high cable bicep curl, a seated preacher curl, and um, like a lengthened shoulder extended curl. It's like, what is going to drive the most stimulus for hypertrophy? It's like, well, which can drive the greatest amount of output? Probably going to immediately deprioritize a high cable bicep curl if otherwise unsupported. My arm just floating off an infinite space. My ability to internally stabilize versus like, you know, in a preacher curl. And then you have to think too, the mechanical tension that we're going to derive from a fully lengthened bicep um, is going to be greater probably in the preacher curl from driving output for being supported in this mid range and being stronger. Or we can make the argument that in a more lengthened position, we can drive more mechanical tension, which seems to be like our superlative driver of, of um, hypertrophy. So we're going to deprioritize the high cable bicep curl. However, the high cable bicep curl carries with its secondary and tertiary adaptations that may make it an effective exercise, an economical exercise selection for those who struggle with getting into the overhead position, right? If I have an inability to maintain my shoulder position here, how am I ever going to press or operate in any degree of abduction greater than that. Let's inoculate that shoulder position, not with a rotator cuff exercise, but with a, you know, with a bicep drill. So we can start to, you know, to hide this, uh, the vegetables in the spaghetti sauce, so to speak, by understanding 
that exercises carry with it a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary adaptation. So now all of a sudden, when I look at a high cable bicep curl, I might have that high up in an index for economical returns for rotator cuff stability or shoulder function, however you want to title that. So I think it's being able to clearly identify all of the different taxonomies, the different families, the different overarching stimulus, and then being able to index and scale accordingly. What are those? That was the next question. Skill. Yeah, how, how do you start to break that down in your brain of all the, the indexes? Um, I think I start from a point of what I'm lacking, right? So pain and performance can be very good guides to tell you, you know, pain, there's a Seinfeld quote from his uh, show called Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. He talks about stubbing his toe. And he's like, pain is knowledge really fast. It's like, I didn't know that the table was there. And I stubbed my toe. So it was an acute awareness of that. So like if I have elbow pain, for example, um, so this could be something where, you know, if I'm doing an overhead dumbbell tricep extension and I get elbow pain, this tells me something about the condition or my capacity to maintain this level of shoulder flexion or abduction and external rotation. So it's like, well, this pain means that I need to create a roadmap from like a safe mode. So like safe mode is when a computer stops working, it reboots at a time in which it was operating properly. You might lose some files where something started to corrupt and then the computer kind of went awry. So finding a range of motion where I can operate where my, my elbow doesn't hurt and then laying out a roadmap to help improve the, the capacity for that position. So pain is one and performance is another. So if I find myself disproportionately weak at a particular movement, I'm going to start to create, I'm going to put that heading at the top. Is it hip extension? Is it knee flexion? Is it knee extension? You know, start to fill in the gaps of like the subcomponents that make up the movement that I'm weak at. So like, for example, right now, my leg press is hilariously weak, which is funny because I squat a lot of weight, but it's weak because I have no capacity to, to maintain any sort of volume. Like I would go through a squat session and do four reps in a training session. They were heavy, but I have no, that other system needs to be swung out to that, to that, uh, that's that, um, the precipice of that adaptation, which is like, I need to drive high output. I'm good at high skill, but I'm not necessarily good at that high output. So my threshold for, you know, being able to, whether it's at a cellular level buffer uh, hydrogen ions or what most people refer to as like lactic acid, whether that's at the cell or at the liver, how is it that I can make this system more efficient? So that's going to be something where I start to drive more volume. And that's based off the fact that, you know, could at one point squat in the 700s, but seven plates on a leg press is stymieing me for eight to 10 reps. That's a discrepancy in performance. So using pain and performance for me are really good guides to start to figure out where it is I need to allocate some of my resources to. And then what categories, when I break down, why does that pain occur or what system is causing a decrease in performance that helps fill in for me, the, the overarching titles, the overarching, um, you know, chapters that I need to index by or higher or create that hierarchical you order. Complete left turn, call it a 180 also, right? Because you've yeah. got a new direction completely yeah. online and it just seems like you're doing extremely well and doing great things. Tell me about it. Yeah, you know, it, it's been interesting because you know, I've been a coach for, you know, 25 years. So, you know, I started um, training in New York City. I opened gyms. I, um, I, I, I launched a couple of companies. I did several raises. I, fortunately, I was fortunate enough to really, I think, develop a pretty good business savvy at a young age. And I think when I exited the gyms, not because they went bad or anything went wrong, it's it just, it was, I found something better. And so I was able to actually part from something that I thought gave me such a level of significance and feel good about it. Like I'm, I'm sure... 15 years ago, if someone turned to you and was like, well, how do you get a handle when you leave bodybuilding? You're going to be like, oh my God. Like, now it's still a part of you, but you've yeah. moved on to something better. So it, it puts you at ease. Like, so I'm not going to sit here and give that story of like, oh, well, business went terrible. And I didn't know it. No, it didn't. I just found something better. Ironically, working with my wife, I mean, she was able to come in and bring an element to the business that I just didn't have the time to be able to focus on. And yeah, it started with, you know, with challenges and selling programs and doing a lot of similar stuff that you do online. And then it really expanded to a lot of brand building and um, you know, a lot of consulting and now having equity in companies. And I was just appointed a board seat to a company that you'll love called Daily Dose. A friend of mine, a chef, Trish Williams, that has bootstrapped this whole project on her own. The, 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 the food is incredible, micronutrient dense, like the way you and I like eat. Like you know, meal prep? 
meal prep, but at a at a level. And yes, we're you know Dr. Gabrielle Lyons on on there as well, and they brought in some thought leaders, and the thought leader portion of it has really helped propel this business. But I'm helping to raise capital and um, bringing together, putting together a team. We're hiring a COO, a CFO, so stuff like that for me is really fun from a brand building standpoint. I'm building I'm building a fitness brand, a fitness company. Um, is something that I feel like I've become very, very good at. And I'm probably a part of about a dozen companies right now. And uh, we're starting to launch some courses for coaches on how to monetize their online business that'll launch in August. My wife and Rob over here has been working for me for years now and have, um, are, are, are putting it together with me. And it's been great. It's been a lot of fun and renovating my house. And my, my kids are 14 and 13. So yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been great to let me 15 hours a week of commuting and freezing my ass off, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in February in New York City. I don't want to be in there anymore anyway. <laughs> when you leave, you leave. Yeah, building this barn out here. It's just, it really has been, you know, I, I was, um, someone said something funny to me the other day, like, Don, you're a 20 year overnight success. And I started laughing because I'm like, shit, you're right. Like, it just, I, I got my face kicked in and it's just not an easy process. And for those people who look at them, I want to do what you do, I'm like, well, then you got to go clean up weights. And you got to work in Equinox and you got to work those hours and you got to, you know, find a parking garage that you can afford at, you know, 4.35 in the morning. And, and you got to do those things. And I know some people don't have to do those things, but it still gave me a viewpoint on work and life that I would never have gotten if I just got into the digital media company. You wouldn't have been as good as who you are now if you didn't come from one extreme. I don't care what anyone says. Right. As, as much as you learn, as much as you become a health, you really have become a health and wellness expert. Like, you know, probably more about, I think, all these different areas than um, any one person. Everything in, under this one umbrella, you really are one of the guys I put at the top of the, of the list. But I think you had, to come, you had to come from that extreme of like weighing your food and eating like dead chicken and rice. And just going from that one extreme, I think, allowed you to expand your mind and, and go into this other area now, which you're obviously a lot happier with. Yeah. And do you know why? I, I've thought about this a lot. It's it's the depth of knowledge that was necessary to push my body to the level that I did. Like, I couldn't have an understanding of exercise to the level that I do if I hadn't pushed harder than most people on the entire planet, you know, and to get to the body fat that I did over and over and over again. I, I, there's no way. Like, I had to understand nutrition. I had to understand recovery. I had to understand health. And, and I was very blessed to have people around who were, who were really, really brilliant. And just ask good questions and keep your mouth shut. You know, I think it's like, and, and for me, it's just like, it was the standard. It's like, I need to know more than, than everyone else because I need to take it to a level that everyone else hasn't. I think that's it. That's why that was so necessary for me. And there, there was also an intensity that you brought to the table that most people can't bring, right? Like, it's, it's just like, and I've worked out with you and you, and you know, like it's in there, Ben, it ain't going anywhere. Like you, you got to switch at a certain point that like when it starts coming out, like that'll always be there and good for you. I think it should be. I, I think that's something that you embrace, but. Even a lot of these young guys now who are training, who are trying to get into it. I'm like, lay out the smartest program on the planet. You still got to come in and you, you got to push beyond a six right now because that's what you're giving me. Like, you're all laughing during eight, eight nine reps. You know, like you, you got to come in there with a specific intensity. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely admire that about you, that you went to almost two extremes. And I think that's kind of what's given you your level of success now. Thanks, Ben. How do you think that social media is impacting people's desire to have long-term outcomes, long-term goals? Long-term, I it's tough. You know, I don't, I don't want to sit here and bash it. Right. Because no, it's, it's given great. you and I, it's given you and I so much. And even my son, the other day, he was hitting, my son got his batting cage. They had 1200 baseballs. He said probably there for four or five hours. He's obsessed. You guys have one in the house? Yeah. Yeah. I put one for him during COVID. I, I, I blew all this money. My wife's like, you better use it. My son is it attached to the barn or is it out there? Outside? No, it's, it's out. We're on two and a half acres. So it's like, literally it's outside. I could probably, I could throw a baseball to it right now from here. But um, I, I look at my son and I'm like, where did you learn that? Because I played college baseball. I'm like, where'd you learn that drill from? He's like, you know, I went on YouTube and I'm looking, I'm, I'm following Aaron Judge's coach. And he has this drill where on the inside pitch, he wants me to move in on the batting cage. So I have to hit the inside pitch here, up the middle here. And then outside, he wants me to wait on the pitch. My son's 13. And I'm like, I didn't have to tell him that. I'm like, wow, social media is awesome, right? Yep. Like, so from that aspect and from, a, I think, a content standpoint, think about it now. Like someone could come on and listen to your podcast, you talking about breathing or psychedelics, or I don't care what it is. And they can go for a walk for an hour and kill two birds and one stone and actually get educated on something where, how are you getting that type of information 
30 years ago. Never. You're From the not. smartest people in the world. You're not. No. You're not. You're bringing the smartest people in the world now yeah. to this that you could put this in your ear and no. you can absorb it and get that much smarter in one hour. So from that standpoint, I think it's amazing. The only area that bums me out a little bit is I, I think there are people out there that are, and I hear it a lot, are setting expectations. You've had this conversation a million times. It's like, guys, don't worry about it. Like, it's not always perfect. They don't always look that way. Like, it's not, I think sometimes when you're always used to seeing people at their best, and I've learned, I've honestly learned to kind of, I've learned to dismiss it now. I'm talking about people I work with. Well, you know, sometimes I'm on there and it bums me out. I'm like, well, it shouldn't. Like, you, you know, like you shouldn't be taking it to heart that much, but people do. And I think that's the only area that could bump people up, that bums me out. I think when you have a young kid at 10 years old and they're looking at someone else and they're like, oh, you know, young girls looking at another 10 year old who has the body she wants. I mean, you're talking about, you, we have young kids, like they're, they're easily, they're, they're easily influenced. How is that setting up their long-term success? Is that going to mess them up to where they suddenly develop some type of body image dysmorphia or are you using in the sense of how my son was using it or my daughter learning my daughter looks at me she's teaching herself guitar and i'm like what are you learning right now she's like i'm gonna learn this song called purple haze and i'm laughing like yeah Jimi hendrix i know i'm like where are you learning that this is an app i downloaded like stuff like that i think is beautiful but yeah i think it's i think there are times where it, it could really screw people up right yeah, and I think I think you nailed it there with like the it's always about the framing that you take on, right? So if I take it as so let's say for example, I look at social media and I aspire to somebody's body, I could I could make that I could make myself a victim to that and go, I don't have the genetics, or I don't have the ability, or I'll never look like that. Or I could turn it around and go, Okay, well, what could I do today that moves me closer in the direction, right? Like what so I look at it like that person becomes a North Star, right? It's like that's how I became a bodybuilder. I'd look at a bodybuilder and go, well, I don't have that guy's chest and that guy's back and that guy's legs. I was like, okay, well, I don't yet, but I, I believe in my ability to follow through. So let's do that, right? Let's just do whatever I can do today to move toward that. Same thing in making money. I'm like, well, I'm not there yet. But like, hey, once I get, once I, once I, if I just continually take daily action in small, important, high value things, I'll get there. You know, I, I think that's, that's the framing is like, it's the empowerment versus the victim mindset. And I think if you would just take that away, and when you look at something, instead of putting people down or instead of saying, oh, screw that person, they have this, or they they are born with a silver spoon in their mouth, or they have gen genetically blessed, that makes you a victim, right? Or you could say, hey, maybe they do have all those things. I don't, but I'm still going to work. Maybe I'll work harder than them, so I'll get a better result because I'll get a better benefit. That's the business plan though, isn't it? And it's kind of wild. Like, you've seen it. Like you'll, you've worked with some pretty successful people, right? Like mm -hmm. super uber high powered, you know, yep. multi, multi millionaires, right? And you look at it, yet they're depressed about their health and wellness, right? So you're looking at someone who's a billionaire and I've worked with, I mean, I've worked with Mike Bloomberg, the guy's worth over $50 billion and, you know, he's trying to get into shape and I'm, you're thinking to yourself and you're, you know, not to use him as an example, but someone who's worth that much money, well, what did you do to get there? Like, well, they, they had an idea and then they, you know, put together a plan and they assembled the team around them because they need the team to help them execute things. Maybe in the beginning, they weren't able to afford that team. So they were working around the clock and I'm like, well, wait a second. Isn't that the same thing with your, with your health? Like your team being your resources, the people that I've stolen more information from you or Jordan or, you know, Charlie Weingroff or Dr. Gabriel, all these people, I'm always a sponge absorbing, but that's, I consider that like my team, right? Like those yeah. are the people that I've gone to for information, but you know, how do you, how does someone, how can someone be so successful in business yet in a way they're a mental midget with their health and wellness? They're just not. And you look at the approach, well, what are you doing for your fitness? Oh, I'm just grabbing workouts online. And I'm like, well, what's your schedule? Well, I don't really have one. Are you doing anything from a food standpoint? Are you doing any type of preparation or any food quality? No, I'm, I'm just ordering when I'm hungry. I'm like, well, listen to yourself right right now. Like, imagine me coming into business and saying, Ben, I want to become a billionaire. And I've got an idea that I want to build this company. Well, how are you going to do it? I'm just going to work. I'm just going to, I don't know. I'm just going to throw ideas out there and, you know, not really use any. I'm just going to, I'm just going to play by you. Like, I'm like, well, wait a second. No, it's got to be, you got to have a little bit of a different focus. Like, like they're the most successful people in the world. Like they learn from mistakes. They, they had a specific they had to start at the finish line mentality. And if they're not doing the same thing with their health and wellness, well, just take the same approach, put it here. It's the same thing. The ability to get into position, right? And that's so nuanced. Like 
Mobility is walking. Mobility is breathing. Mobility is bending over to touch your, your toes or tie your shoes. Mobility is putting your shirt on in the morning. Mobility is putting the seatbelt on in the car, right? You don't notice these things until you can't do them anymore. To be honest, what you guys don't acknowledge is as we age, regardless of your age, as we age, these ranges just get a little bit shorter, don't they? You just get a little bit tighter, just get a little bit harder to access. Well, ultimately, everyone listening to this podcast has some desire to extend their life. Yes, longevity is a very hot phrase right now. Well, I can tell you with 100% certainty, if you can hold off the call it the closing of the walls around you, which means the tightening of the joints, the shortening of the ranges of motion, if you can hold that off, you will preserve your brain into older age. So the brain has evolved for complex movement. And the less we move or the less complex the movements are, the less stimulation the brain gets. So ultimately, as we age, we want to be one, maintaining those ranges, two, learning new movements and ranges of motion as we age so that we can ultimately sustain the brain's ability to access those positions, right? The brain is a learning machine. If we stop doing complex movements, the brain stops needing to do them. It's a use it or lose it scenario. You don't do it. Your brain goes, gets tighter. And to be honest, I've been guilty of this in COVID. Uh, again, I don't share this stuff often, but I'm, I'm going to go in the future. COVID has been extremely stressful for me, extremely stressful for me. And I'll share why in the future. Um, and I'm sitting a lot. I'm building a business. I'm growing my business a lot. I'm doing a lot of writing. I'm writing my book. I'm writing a lot of content for my business. I'm a lot of writing content for you guys. And uh, I'm writing a lot of workout programs for my clients. I'm sitting a lot more than I ever have in my life. My mobility is not great right now. Like, I think generally it's better than most people. I know generally it's better than most people, but compared to my standard of excellence, it's not where I want it to be. And so I've recommitted myself to improving both my mobility, my aesthetic, and my strength. Just because like, you know, there's seasons of life. Right now, my season of life has been building my business and dealing with some personal stress until I get those things out of the way. I just kind of wanted to put my fitness, not necessarily the back burner, just not as the top priority. And again, that's acceptable, at least for me. You can choose to, to believe what you will. But you know, sometimes in life, there's going to be things that take precedent. And that's how life works. And for me, right in this past season of life, the last call it the last two years, since really the beginning of COVID, eh, maybe even beginning of 2000, end of 2020, end of 2020. So maybe a year and a bit, my fitness has been third or fourth priority. That's okay, right? Because I know how to do it. I know how to reverse it. And again, I'm not bad relative to most people, but like still not toward the level I want to be, but uh, I'll never let my mobility go. So the way I balance my training is I literally, and I advise everyone to, to do this at some level is your alternate, for me, it's alternating days. Training is Monday. Tuesday is cardio and yoga, Wednesday is training, Thursday is cardio and yoga. And I just alternate that way. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's right. It just means it's right for me. And everything's a ratio, right? So my training, how often do you want to train? If four days a week isn't enough, then I remove one yoga and I put in one more training day. If four days of training is too much, then I pull one away and I put in yoga day and a cardio day. And it's just this, like, it's like imagine volume knobs, right? I'm going to dial one up and dial one back. So as I address mobility, guys, um, my suggestion to you is, your spine, your hips, and your shoulders every day, every single day, like multiple times a day. And so learn all the motions that you need to improve your spinal mobility, which ultimately if you is flexion, extension, so rounding, extending, it's rotation, and it's side bend. Those are kind of it, right? There's not huge numbers of, of um, ranges of motion. And same with your shoulders, your hips, and even your ankles. And I, I won't say knees because I don't believe you, for most people that Knees are an issue, like knees are a secondary issue, meaning if you fix your hips and your ankles, your knees simply get better. These are almost never the problem. Um, okay, moving along quickly here. Number four, stability, the ability to resist force. So ultimately, if I stand, sit, or uh, position myself and exercise, how well can I not move? And many of you guys, if you've ever taken yoga class or you've ever done one of my workouts, uh, you'll know the ability to not move is uh, sometimes even more difficult than the ability to move. And I think this is ultimately why most people train poorly. I was going to cuss, but I won't. Poorly, because being stable is hard, right? And most people don't train for the challenge. Most people simply train to say they train, just like most people read books to say they read books, not to actually grow up to learn or grow from the book. Stability, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most important factors in your ability to build muscle. If you're not stable, you don't build muscle. So what does it mean to be stable? It means the ability to go into a position and not move. And that means not just standing up. That means not just standing on one leg. 
that's going to the ends of the range and staying there and not moving. Right. Another reason why I like yoga, because it's built in. It's just what you do. You don't have to be, you don't have to think about it. They just do it for you. So if you're not somebody who doesn't understand this, take a yoga class, right? Standing in, in warrior two, standing in warrior three, standing in any exercise or sorry, any yoga position ultimately is, is challenging stability, right? All of the side bends, all of the, the forward folds with the spine extensions, those are all creating stability, right? You're creating mobility, yes, call it quote unquote flexibility, but you're also creating stability when, they, when, when done correctly, yoga is meant to be a breathing practice more than it is a movement practice. And when you're staying in these positions for extended periods of time, ultimately the stability is built into the process. And I build stability into all of my workouts, whether you're for myself or for my clients. Every one of you guys who've taken done all my programs will know stability is built in, in a, from a perspective of what I say is challenging time. So when you're training stability, there's three ways to train, train stability. First, you challenge time. Then you challenge distance. And then you challenge load or resistance. So when, how do I challenge time? Well, you guys, if you've ever done a muscle intelligence program and my 40 program, you know that I'm big on challenging time, which means I slow down, slow down the eccentrics, add in isometric pauses at the ends of the range, slow down concentrics even to some, from time to time, and prove to your mind, prove to your brain that you're strong enough, that you're in control enough to actually control this thing and build muscle. So for most of you, stability can, be, can start with something really small. Stand on one foot, right? And then deviate your center of mass by bending over or lifting your leg up and stay there. And try to do that with, with push-ups. Do one arm, just plank at the top, and then do side planks. And then you could progress to any type of movements, like maybe a lunge, the bottom of a lunge, and stay there. The bottom of a squat and stay there. Think of like how do we challenge stability? Well, ultimately, it's narrowing your center of mass. Or, or, sorry, narrowing your, your, yeah, your center of mass, your center of gravity. Um, which means like going from wide position to narrow, then to one foot, narrowing your, your center of gravity, and then deviating your center of mass, which means like bending over, moving it away from uh, you know, the, the center of your mass. Think of like the center of the earth, right? You, each of every human has like a center of their mass. And if you deviate away from that, you move a piece, a piece of your body away from that, it challenges your ability to be stable. My suggestion, always do this stuff barefoot because when you add shoes in, it's a whole different dimension of challenge. All right, so we got five more. I'm going to breeze these a little more quickly, even though they're important. Number five, so we're viewing number one, structural balance. Number two, breathing and walking. Number three is mobility. Number four is stability. Number five is cardiovascular fitness. Now, technically, this isn't a part of movement, but it is a big part of training. And cardiovascular fitness, in my mind, includes aerobic and anaerobic fitness. And why this is important, uh, we're basically, this is our energy system. This is our ability to produce energy. This is our ability to recover between sets. This is also our ability to actually perform work. So you can't do these things. You must, right? So one thing I'll, I'll bring back to kind of the front of mind, each of these things should be built into your program. If you're not, you're failing, right? It doesn't have to be in huge amounts, but you should vary it based on how poor you're doing in each one. You're doing really well at one of them. Don't pursue that one more, even though that is our tendency. Pursue the one that maybe you're not so good at. You know, you're only as good as your weakest link is a really important systems analysis approach. So your body is a complex system. So always approach the weakest link. So what am I not good at? So as we're going through this list, pay attention to yourself and say, which one am I not good at? And if there's one you're not good at, you need to address it. And for some specific challenge you're having in your workout, I promise you, you're not alone. There's thousands, if not millions of other people out there experiencing the exact same challenges right now. Your challenges are not unique. That's the irony, right? I've dealt with this stuff thousands of times. And you know, I talked to a guy today in, in Costa Rica here and uh, just like acknowledging, man, that what you're doing is not hard. You simply don't know how yet. And if I came to your business and I said, hey, could you teach me how to do what you do? You could do it. You'd be confident in that. And so when you come into my business, I'm very confident in my ability to teach you whatever you need to learn. If I don't have the answers, I have someone in my community that does. So coming back to this, this uh, cardiovascular fitness piece, it needs to be a part of your training program. There's been a lot of people throughout time. So you don't need cardio to lose fat. You don't necessarily. However, you need cardio to, to thrive. You need cardio to improve aerobic fitness, to be able to recover, to improve HRV. I don't want to get into that yet, but so many so much value uh, for someone to not do cardiovascular training or say it's not valuable is a mistake. And, and it's I don't fault people in that case because I realize for them right now, it's not an issue. These guys out there are like, chirping that they don't need cardio. Yeah, for you, you don't. But I'd say 95% of the world does. 
But at some point they will, and they're going to go, oh shit, I didn't realize how important it was. Some people naturally have great cardio. Some people train really hard in the gym and that trains their cardio. Most people simply do not. And mo typically most weight training shouldn't be your aerobic training, right? Weight training should be your anaerobic resistance training. It shouldn't be aerobic. Thanks for listening to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. For full episode guides with important takeaways and bonus resources, head over to muscleintelligence.com slash learn. If you enjoy the show and find value in the content, please subscribe, share this podcast with at least one person you know and love who would benefit from this content, leave us a review and support our sponsors. You can see the full list of show sponsors, discounts, and get exclusive Muscle Intelligence deals at muscleintelligence.com slash resources. To join our private community and get VIP access to my master classes, upcoming muscle camps, and other resources that we don't post anywhere else, head to muscleintelligence.com slash community. Most of all, thank you very much for your trust, for your time, and most importantly, for supporting health and fitness in this world. Enjoy your day, and I look forward to seeing you here next week. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.